Good morning, world. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I am your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. I want to take a little detour from the normal realm of literary affairs that we deal in to talk about a great story. One of my favorite stories. About a book that I probably haven't read in like over a decade since I was a teenager. But it's excellent. This is about a group of kids in Norway who sought to create a genre of rock and roll that was more extreme than any other thus far. They called it black metal. Nowadays you've probably seen all sorts of memes mocking or poking fun of the genre with all the goofy face paint and the leather studded armbands on Tumblr or uh, maybe you've seen a Vice documentary or anything, any number of things found in or around the dump of the internet. But imagine growing up in a time when you didn't have the internet when the only modes of communication between people on different continents were far more mysterious and elusive, when all you saw of obscure genres of music were dim, dark, gritty, dirty, high contrasty black and white photos in obscure magazines and languages that you didn't speak, on cassettes that were unmarked, or through, shock and awe, only word of mouth. When certain people and certain bands were still just legends. But let's go back a little bit. We could loosely track it like this. In the early 80s, there was a heavy metal band from England called Venom. Obviously, they were edgy for their time because they sung about Satan and walked around with plastic skulls and dressed up in leather pants. But today, they're about as intimidating as the village people. But they had a song called Black Metal, which is now kind of a standard of the genre, right? So it kind of like starts right there. Uh, but they're not taking it too seriously, right? They're playing it pretty hard, but they're not, they're not that serious. Then we go to the early 80s, and we have this obscure band from Sweden, which sounds like Motorhead, but played twice as fast with, like, these incomprehensible growls and screams and these weird, like, <laughs> solos. I mean, like, just fucked up shit. The only photographs that existed from this guy were, like, these high-contrast, black-and-white, gritty things. Once again, with, like, pentagrams, bullet belts, and fake skulls. But... The sound was way more intense. Then some kids in the middle of Norway decided to create the most absolutely horrifying, unapologetically satanic, violent, hatred-filled, shit-kicking, tough-as-nails metal the world has ever seen. Start a band over entitled Mayhem. And that's essentially where our story starts. At the same time, you have stuff going on in Zurich like Celtic Frost, and you have uh, bands like a Sarcophago in the middle of Brazil. You have this energy in this music, this aggression and speed of thrash metal and hardcore punk like Discharge or something. But with like the theatricality of Black Sabbath and Merciful Fate. Then you have all these references to like Nordic mythology and paganism and Satanism and all these things. Uh, these kids literally start inventing a sound that is darker than any other music being played in the world at the time. Several figures are key here in Norway. You have Uystein Arset, the guitarist from Mayhem and the owner of a small record shop that only has like all these, uh, you know, obscure, very, very, very heavy titles. Second is a young kid who befriends him who goes by the name of Varg Vikernes, who is doing his own one-man band, Bursum. Third is a kid whom nobody knows what to do with. He goes by the name of Simply Dead and is the vocalist for Mayhem. To give you a little insight into the kind of the character that Dead was, this was a kid who would take his pants, bury them out in the middle of the woods, and then drag them up for a show weeks later as they had rotted with dirt and bugs and all this shit. And apparently he would keep a dead bird in a plastic bag and would huff it before going on to stage with Mayhem so he could get the scent of death in his lungs. A lot of this is probably not made up. So, these were kids, right? They were either still teenagers or just barely out of their teenage years. Many of them were extremely young, goofy, unorganized, confused, drunk, frustrated, dirt poor, but they were very, very ambitious. And if you didn't know that they were kids, right? If all you got was the expression, if all you had was the music and the photos at the time, you'd be just like, what? Holy shit. Never was there a more seemingly dangerous form of rock and roll. That's the difference between the other genres and black metal. Because some shit went down. Dead, who is depressed and melancholy, shoots himself in the head at a cabin in the woods where Mayhem all lived together. They didn't even have a telephone. 
Oystein, the guitarist, he finds him, starts taking pictures of, you know, his corpse and pulling out fragments of his skull and sending it to people that he deems worthy in the black metal scene or whatever, taking pieces of his brain and cooking it up in a stew. I'm not making this shit up. Uh, he does all of this before he calls the police. And, you know, even some of the other members of the band are horrified, right? He was ecstatic that Dead committed suicide because it provided a catalyst for him to push things as far as it could possibly go. So then you have certain individuals in the community who start burning down churches and things begin to really, really escalate. The media starts to go into a frenzy with all these church burning Satanists in Norway. Some of these things are getting blown out of proportion and some of them really are not. So Oystein starts pissing everybody off. He starts sending death threats to people. He owes people money. Things are getting out of hand. So this kid Varg has a falling out with Oystein and he confronts him at his apartment, Oystein's apartment. And according to him, Oystein runs for a knife and depending on who you're talking to, Varg commits an act of self-defense or cold-blooded murder. Either way, he stabs the hell out of Oystein and was put in prison subsequently for a very long time. And this blew everything, I mean, this is when the, everything really started escalating in the media. And today he is a free man and even has his own YouTube channel. So these are just some of the components in the book, not to mention all the other arson, suicides, and murders <laughs> related to this whole thing. Heavy metal, true crime, Satanism, what more could you want? And regarding the music, if you have not heard it, it's not for everyone, and it tries its hardest not to be. But somewhere in there, the energy unleashed by it, coupled with the near mythological stories you'd hear from people and read in books such as this, forged an international community that is really impressive in its enormity. The violence, hatred, and abysmal darkness seem to connect with a lot more people around the world than I think these kids have ima would have imagined. Lords of Chaos has gotten a lot of flack by people in the bands interviewed in the book or others who were involved in the scene. And certainly there must be some sort of journalistic sensationalism uh, or, uh, around the events that took place. But for, an but for an introduction, for like the basic things that did happen, this is a fine start. And to top it all off, there is a film adaptation of this book being produced this very moment, slated to be directed by Jonas Ackerland, who was the original drummer for Bathory, and is now a massively successful music video director for artists such as Beyonce or Lady Gaga. Yes, the guy who directed Telephone is the dude who drummed for the band that started it all and is now making a movie about it. That is better than food. Please check it out in the link below, subscribe, stick around, plenty of great stuff coming up. Please always remember what John Waters said, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, do not fuck them. Have a great day, see you soon. Ciao.